Okay. Good. So the kidneys, my favorite organ. I love the kidneys. So with uh, nephrology always comes uh, electrolytes and fluid balance. So remember that hyponatremia is caused by too much water. So the first things you want to do are check the osmolarity and then check the volume status. Are they hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic? So um, some causes of hypervolemic hyponatremia, congestive heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, cirrhosis, um, hypovolemic hyponatremia, that's if you're losing a lot of fluids either by taking too much Lasix or vomiting, and then euvolemic hyponatremia, really the, the main thing it should make you think of on the test is SIADH. So if they're a smoker, it's chest X-ray city. So uh, more importantly for your exam, how do we treat it? So normal saline, obviously, anytime the patient is hypotensive or shows symptoms of being fluid down, just give them normal saline because that's how we resuscitate them. The only time you would give hypertonic saline, 3% saline, is if they're symptomatic, if they're having seizures related to the low sodium, or if their sodium's in the toilet, less than 120. Um, otherwise, if they're not volume down, and if they're not having seizures, you just fluid restrict them and wait for the uh, fluid balance to come back into equilibrium. Why don't we want to uh, treat this too fast? central pontine myelinolysis. So the magic number, you don't want to treat more than 12 to 24 milliequivalents per day. So that's like 0.5 to 1 per hour. And then hypernatremia, hypernatremia then conversely is uh, due to a loss of water and we treat it by replacing water. So that's about it. Again, we don't want to go too fast here because we can see cerebral edema as the um, adverse effect of that. So Central pontine myelinolysis when you correct hyponatremia, cerebral edema when you correct hypernatremia too aggressively. All right, so what if your patient has numbness, uh, those, those dead guys who I can't say, or a prolonged QT interval? Hypocalcemia, very good. Uh, what about bone stones, groans, crazy? Hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia, oops, hypercalcemia, good. Uh, what if they've got some paralysis, uh, they're very constipated, when you do an EKG, you see ST depression and some U waves. Hypokalemia, and those peak T waves we saw earlier. Hyperkalemia, oops, that's how you treat it, hyperkalemia. More importantly, how do you treat hyperkalemia? Because you might very well get a question on this. Calcium gluconate is first, why? stabilizes the cardiac membranes, right? So that's first, but that doesn't do anything about having too much potassium in your body. So what do we do for that? You can do k -exalate. A lot of hospitals don't do that, but they still use it at the VA. k basically makes you poop out potassium, so that helps. What else? Insulin with glucose too, right? So insulin to drive the um, potassium into the cells, but we still have too much in our body. How do we get rid of it? Diuretics. Good. So that's the treatment regimen. So calcium gluconate, insulin and glucose, K-exalate. Um, albuterol works through a similar mechanism to insulin and then um, and diuretics to get rid of it. Last resort, if the patient's really symptomatic and potassium is sky high, it's an indication for dialysis. So acid-base disorders, I won't belabor these. Um, let's just hit the high points. If the um, bicarbonate is high, and PCO2 is high, and they are um, alkalotic, then we know it's metabolic. And the next test then to do would be a urine chloride, because that's how we tell what is causing the metabolic alkalosis. So if the chloride is high, then we're thinking maybe we've got a hyperaldosterone state, uh, whereas if the chloride is low, then we're doing something to lose chloride, either too aggressive NG suction, too much throwing up, um, so forth and so on. So if we've got a, an alkalosis where CO2 is low and bicarb is low, then it's respiratory, right? So we're blowing off too much of the CO2. That's like in our, our uh, asthma attack patient in the early stages. So if uh, bicarb is low and PCO2 is low, that's describing a metabolic acidosis, and the next thing to calculate if they give you the information to do so is the anion gap. 
So uh, remember that normal is 8 to 12, and if it's elevated, start thinking about one of those items in the differential that fills out that mnemonic mud piles. Uh, and then non-GAP metabolic acidoses, there are fewer causes there. Diarrhea um, and diabetic use are the main ones. And then those silly renal tubular acidoses, anybody else have a hard time with those? Me too. I got a slide on them coming up. And then PCO2 is high and bicarb is high. That's a respiratory acidosis. Hyper, hypoventilation is the overwhelming cause of that. So let's talk about these RTAs. They're a cause of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So type 1, is it proximal or distal? Distal. Um, and the cause is lithium is the main one that I've seen in clinical vignettes. Uh, and at presentation, the things to remember are that the urine is alkalotic and in the blood there's low potassium. So how do we treat type 1? RTA. We'll give them bicarb. We'll give them bicarb. Because the problem is with proton excretion, giving oral bicarb will help. That's in contrast to type 2 that we'll talk about right now. So type 2 is proximal. Um, the most common cause that I've seen in clinical vignettes is multiple myeloma. And it's also hypokalemic on presentation. Uh, but the problem is they can't reabsorb bicarb. So giving bicarbonate doesn't solve the problem here because our problem uh, in pathogenesis is we can't reabsorb it. So here, we just give a mild diuretic and replete their potassium. So type 4 is hyperrenemic hypoaldosteronism, uh, and the overwhelming majority are caused by diabetes. So that's the important thing to remember for your clinical vignettes. On presentation, the thing that differentiates it from type 1 and 2 is that they're hyperkalemic, uh, which makes sense, right, if they've got low aldo. And then we treat this by repleting mineralocorticoids, so we give them flugicortisone. So I think to, to get these questions right on the test, remember the major causes of the three types, remember what potassium does, and remember how to treat them. And I think really, and then remember between 1 and 2, the difference between distal and proximal and whether the problem is protons or bicarb. And you should be able to get all the questions right uh, that they could ask you with that information. Okay, definition of acute renal failure. ARF. Has to do with what thing on chemistry? Creatinine. Okay, does it go up or down? Okay, you're awake. So it goes up. Um, and how much? It's, it's kind of loosely defined. There are a couple different definitions depending on the source. In general, if there's an overall increase by 25% or um, a net increase of 0.5 over baseline, it's acute renal failure. And to further work it up, you want the BUN creatinine ratio because that can help you determine between pre-renal and intrinsic renal causes. Uh, you'll also want to check the urine, uh, sodium, and creatinine so you can calculate the FINA, and you will have to do that on your test probably. Um, and then remember, if the patient's on a diuretic, the phena is not reliable. You need to calculate the phenurea. And why is that? Yeah, so if you're on a diuretic, even if your body would naturally want to hold on to it in the prerenal state, you're going to be peeing out all kinds of sodium because you're taking a diuretic that blocks the channels. So it's not a reliable indicator. So um, treatment is easy if it's prerenal. Um, you'll want to repeat, replete the fluids or otherwise reverse the cause of the prerenal azotemia to begin with. Um, and it can be caused by anything that prevents blood flow to the kidneys, either because of global hypoperfusion or um, renal artery stenosis, anything that keeps blood flow from, from getting to the kidneys. So intrinsic causes are a little bit more interesting. So what would be the cause of renal failure in a patient who has muddy brown casts, uh, they just took some amphotericin, amigoglycoside, cisplatin, and they had prolonged ischemia. Okay, ATN, good. So muddy brown casts on UA, that's the hallmark of ATN. Uh, what if the patient has protein in the, in the pee, blood in the pee, eosinophils in the pee, and they also have a fever and a rash after they took some trim sulfa? Yes, that's AIN. And the treatment here, uh, obviously we're going to stop the drug that's causing it because this is a, an allergic reaction that occurs in the kidney. And steroids can also be added um, if it doesn't resolve on its own. So if we've got an army recruit or crush victim, CPK is sky high. Uh, 
There's blood on the dipstick, but negative red blood cells. Rhabdo, yes. So first test, this is important. If you suspect rhabdomyolysis, you need to either check potassium or get an EKG. You always want to think about what's going to kill your patient. You know, uh, ATN, um, you know, renal failure is not going to kill your patient immediately, but hyperkalemia will, right? It can, it can cause um, arrhythmias and death. So if you ever suspect crush injury or suspect they're trying to point you in the direction of rhabdo, get a potassium level or an EKG. So what if you see envelope-shaped uh, crystals on the urinalysis? Yeah, life's not that bad, right? Don't don't drink the antifreeze. So ethylene glycol intoxication will give you envelope-shaped crystals, and that causes an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Uh, and then if you get a bump in creatinine a day or two, or two or three days, rather, after a cardiac cath or a contrast CT, good, <laughs> contrast-induced nephropathy. The timeline is important here. 48 to 72 hours is very characteristic uh, if contrast-induced nephropathy is going to happen. All right, so the five indications for emergent dialysis. What's the A for? Acidosis. E, electrolytes, specifically potassium. I, intoxication, specifically of? Ethium glycol or lithium, sure. Um, o, Super bad CHF, U, uremia. So what they might say to suggest uremia in a clinical vignette, pericarditis or like really bad confusion, altered mental status. So don't fall into the trap. Uh, a creatinine of a million is not an indication for emergent dialysis. Well, maybe a million, but not a high one. Okay, so for chronic kidney disease, um, you know this from working with our population. The number one cause is diabetes. Second most common is hypertension. Most common cause of death are cardiovascular complications. So the complications you'll look for, this will be in a vignette that's describing an outpatient visit. Um, hypertension can cause CHF. You can get um, an anemia because the kidney disease leads to a loss of erythropoietin. Um, there are electrolyte abnormalities. You can see high potassium, high phosphorus, and low calcium. And then you can get a secondary hyperparathyroidism. The low calcium because of the kidney disease tells the parathyroid gland to ramp up PTH. And then uremia, we talked about, um, about the symptoms of that. The other one I would add uh, are bleeding after, after an operation. So that could show up on your surgery shelf or your medicine shelf. Uremia from chronic kidney disease causes the platelets not to um, clot properly, so they're at an increased risk of bleeding. So your patient's peeing blood, best first test. UA, what if painless hematuria? It's what until proven otherwise. Cancer, so either of the bladder or of the kidney. Um, terminal hematuria, that means you're peeing fine and then you got a few clots at the end. That's bladder cancer, very good. Um, if the blood cells look like little Mickey Mouse ears. Yeah, that's glomerular problems. Uh, if they're dysmorphic. The definition of nephritic syndrome? So proteinuria, but not, not nephrotic range. What else? Hematuria, hypertension, and kidney failure, azotemia. So good. And um, so what if you're peeing blood one to two days after a runny nose, sore throat, and cough? This is the most common cause of nephritis. What? Mm, not one to two days later. And this is after like a virus, runny nose, cough, kind of like flu -y type stuff. Burgers. So IgA nephropathy, the timeline is important. See the difference between these two? One to two days later, and if they're more viral symptoms, that's burgers, IgA nephropathy. If it's one to two weeks later, and they had a sore throat or impetigo, then you're thinking post stress So um, it seems silly, but the time course really is the determining factor here. Hematuria plus hemoptysis, that's bad. Good pastures. Hematuria plus deafness and maybe a positive family history. Alports, good. Very good. And those are both problems with collagen 4, either an antibody against it in the basement membrane or a mutation in it. All right, so what if you're a kiddo 
peeing blood after a, an infection, and also with arthralgias and purpura and abdominal pain. He knocks Sean line. Good. A, hito, a kiddo status per, post hamburger and diarrhea with renal failure. It must have been late when I was making this slide. Um, yes, that's HUS. Good. The maha is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and petechiae. Those are other um, symptoms of HUS. A cardiac patient after teclopidine and renal failure, maha, low platelets, fever, and altered mental status. TTP, good. So why is the teclopidine in there? It's been shown to cause TTP. So they actually don't use teclopidine very much anymore because it shows um, an increased risk of having TTP. So the important thing to remember here, the treatment is emergent plasmapheresis. Do not give platelets to these patients. That will be an answer choice. Do not choose it uh, because the, the process that's consuming the platelets and causing the thrombocytopenia is going to just continue to consume any more platelets you throw in there. So uh, this can be a confusing clinical picture to confuse with DIC. You can tell the difference because your coags will be normal in either HUS or TTP. Uh, prothrombin time and um, PTT are both going to be normal. Um, so a patient who has C. anca, kidney and lung and sinus involvement, and they're peeing blood. Wagner's, good. Um, P. anca, asthma, eosinophilia. Schurg Strauss. P. anca, no lung involvement, and they might have hep B. Yeah, here's polyarteritis nodosa. Good. Okay, so kidney stones, uh, they hurt like the dickens. The best test is a CT because that's going to detect all stones, not just the ones that will show up on, a, on an X-ray. Uh, the most common type of kidney stone, calcium oxalate. Um, a kid who has a family history of kidney stones, cysteine. Um, chronic indwelling Foley, and their P is very alkaline. Good. Struvite stones from um, any type of bug that's got a urease. So Proteus, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, or Staph. Uh, if a kiddo with leukemia is being treated with chemo, and then they develop stones. Uric acid stones. Good. And oop, if um, after a bowel resection for volvulus, you're at risk for pure oxalate stones. Uh, and that's because if you have a large segment of bowel that's resected, you can't adequately reabsorb the calcium. So the oxalate that's left behind precipitates out and makes a pure oxalate stone. So little bitty stones, how do we treat them? Yeah, sucks to be you. So got to pass them, give them some fluids. If it's a ginormous two centimeter stone, for the, for the super giant ones, we cut them out. For the medium sized ones, we'll use lithotripsy. So super small, Tough luck, got to pass it. Super huge, we'll actually surgically remove it. Somewhere in between, we'll break it up and let the fragments pass. So for proteinuria, the best first test is to repeat the UA because it may just be a transient um, finding. The definition of nephrotic syndrome, that's we have um, proteinuria on the larger scale, greater than 3.5, also low albumin, edema, and hyperlipidemia. So what they might describe in the vignette are some fatty or waxy casts. Uh, the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in kiddos? What? Minimal change. And in adults? Membranous. Good. What about in a patient who's using heroin or has AIDS? Focal segmental. Um, associated with chronic hepatitis. Membrano proliferative. Um, and this is important right here. If a nephrotic patient suddenly develops flank pain, are you worried about that? Is it a kidney stone or what? You're worried about renal vein thrombosis. Absolutely. So why? Why are we so scared about renal vein thrombosis in a nephrotic syndrome patient? Absolutely. So we know they're peeing protein, right, because their glomeruli suck. Uh, they're also peeing out clotting factors and um, coagulation necessary things. So renal vein thrombosis is always the biggest fear if someone with nephrotic syndrome gets flank pain. And some other random causes, uh, you can have just orthostatic proteinuria, 
that multiple myeloma can cause proteinuria, um, pregnancy can cause proteinuria, fever, or congestive heart disease.